It is good to be with you again to study together tonight. I hope to see you on Sunday, either at 9 or 10.30 a.m., if, if at all possible. If you need any help signing up, please get in touch either with me or with Kenna. It is so nice to be able to do this, and we had a good number of visitors this past Sunday. Uh, some with us from, I think, three different states, a family visiting together, coming up here to the Dells. They were looking for a solid place to worship, and it was so nice for me to be able to uh, look at the Sign Up Genius account and to be able to recommend which service they would fit in, because there were uh, six of them from that one family from three different states. And so, again, thank you so much for doing that. And again, if you need any help with that, get in touch, uh, get in touch with me. Uh, tonight, we continue with our study of the book of Acts. Acts, of course, explains the growth of the early church. It's written by Luke, a medical doctor, to a man by the name of Theophilus. And in the ABCs of Acts, we've, we've looked at the first six chapters so far, and we summarized chapter one using the word ascension, referring to the ascension of Jesus back into heaven. Chapter two was B, the beginning of the church. So Peter preaches, 3,000 people are baptized and added by God to the church. In Acts chapter 3, we saw a man carried by his friends and left at the temple gate. He is then healed by Peter and John. And so the summary is carried and cured. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested. They're threatened by the council to stop preaching about Jesus, but they are determined disciples. And so they don't stop, but they continue on preaching as they had previously. In Acts chapter 5, we had the empty jail as Peter and the other apostles are arrested. They're then let out of jail by the angel. And so we have empty jail and they go back to preaching and teaching there as well. Last week, we looked at Acts chapter 6 and we summarized chapter 6 with the words first deacons, but always with the question mark. If you remember the Greek speaking widows, they're getting overlooked in the daily serving of food. The apostles, they kind of want to help with that. It's an important thing that needs to be done, but they cannot neglect prayer and preaching. And so they give some qualifications and they tell the church to choose a number of men. So the church chooses seven men who meet those qualifications and then they're appointed by the apostles. And these men then take care of that problem. So they seem to be doing the work the deacons do. They are appointed in a similar way. They serve tables. That's a word very similar to the word that we would translate today as deacon or servant or server. But they're never explicitly given the label deacon. And so, again, they seem to be deacons, but we always want to keep the question mark there because it's not really nailed down for us in Scripture. In the last half of Acts chapter 6, Stephen, one of those seven men selected to serve, he goes out preaching and performing miracles. And the religious leaders see that and they get upset and, and they're not able to answer his arguments. And so they induce people to give false testimony and they bring Stephen in front of the council to face those charges. As we learned last week, all of this is very similar to what these men do to Jesus or had done to Jesus just a short time earlier. And that's where we left it last week. Stephen is in front of the council, that is the Sanhedrin. And Luke says that his face looked like the face of an angel. Tonight, we basically have Stephen's defense before the council, and it's pretty long. In fact, it's the longest sermon in the New Testament outside, probably the Sermon on the Mount. And so we're only going to make it probably 80 or 90 percent of the way through the sermon itself. And I hesitate to spoil it for us, but those who hear this sermon for the first time, they get so mad at the end of it that they kill Stephen. And Stephen becomes the first martyr of the Christian faith. Stephen is the first killed for being a Christian. And so this is why I'm saying this now. We summarize chapter 7 with the words, Great Hero. Stephen is the great hero. In the past, one of our members has suggested God is everywhere. And I think that came from uh, one of our young people years, years ago. And God is everywhere. That's a pretty good summary of chapter 7, as we'll see in just a moment. Uh, someone else has suggested good servant or a great servant. That also applies to Steve. Stephen would also be great. Um, great sermon, good sermon. Those have also been suggested, uh, but I'm liking great hero. And it, it just honors Stephen for what he does here and the courage that he has. And so if you think of something better, let me know. But for now, at least I'm going with great hero. And in this chapter, in his defense, Stephen basically gives an awesome summary of Jewish history. And what he's doing is highlighting all of the ways that God's people, especially the leaders, have completely blown it down through the years. And again, I hesitate to spoil it. We won't get to it until next week. But Stephen's conclusion basically is, 
you people on this council are completely missing the point, just like all of your forefathers did. That's just a paraphrase of his conclusion. Uh, the actual insult is actually a lot, uh, it's a lot better than that. Uh, quite a bit more graphic and severe, uh, but we'll save the grand finale for next week. But tonight, let's start working our way through history as Stephen sets this up. As we work our way through Stephen's defense, I want us to remember the charges brought against him. As you may remember from last week, the Jewish council has accused him, number one, of blaspheming Moses, speaking against Moses. And then secondly, they accuse him of speaking against this holy place, referring to the temple where they are and the law itself. So as we go forward here, let's notice, first of all, how respectful Stephen is of Moses, the man he's accused of blaspheming. And secondly, how he emphasizes that God is active outside his temple, that God is indeed everywhere. So he's going to take the two charges against him and he's going to use that uh, to teach just a powerful sermon convicting these men of what they've done. We start tonight then with Acts chapter 7 verses 1 through 8 as Stephen stands there before the council. He's already been accused, he's had the two charges read, and this is where we pick up with Acts 7 verses 1 through 8. The high priest said, are these things so? And he said, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him move to this country in which you are now living. But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet, even when he had no child, he promised that he would give to him as give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke to this effect, that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. And whatever nation to which they will be in bondage, I myself will judge. And God said, and after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. So up in verse 1, the high priest gets it started by asking, are these things so? In other words, we would say today, guilty or not guilty? You know, how do you plead to the charges? And so he's referring to those charges that Stephen has blasphemed Moses and that he's spoken against the temple and the law. In the rest of this chapter, Stephen will then answer these charges, and he starts with Abraham. And notice how Stephen includes himself as a part of Jewish history and as a fellow Jew. So he refers to the men on the Sanhedrin as brethren and fathers. And so he is completely respectful of these men. He tells the truth in his defense, but he is as respectful as he can possibly be in the process. Notice he also refers to our father Abraham. In other words, he's emphasizing that Abraham is our father. So we should all be on the same team here. In a sense, Abraham is a father of Christianity, isn't he? As Christians, we claim Abraham as our father. We are children of Abraham, uh, children of the promise, as Paul will go on to explain in much greater detail over in Romans chapter 9. Uh, we won't look in detail at every word in Stephen's defense. It's just, it's incredibly long, and we don't have time to just hover over every word here. But I do hope we notice in this first section that God appeared to Abraham outside the temple. And so even before there was such a thing as a temple, in fact, God appeared to Abraham hundreds of miles away from where the temple would eventually be built, and hundreds of years later. And Stephen seems to emphasize uh, only many years after this, did Abraham settle in this country in which you are now living. In other words, you're kind of newcomers here in the big picture of things. And so several times here, Stephen seems to be emphasizing the timing of this. Abraham and his descendants obeyed God, and they served God with faith for hundreds of years before coming back here to the land of promise. At the end of this first paragraph, Stephen explains the origins of circumcision, and explains that Abraham obeys. And this will be very important in understanding the insult that comes later in Stephen's defense. 
Well, let's continue tonight with Acts 7, verses 9 through 16. Acts 7, 9 through 16. The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. Yet God was with him and rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. Now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction with it, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. On the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob his father and all his relatives to come to him, seventy-five persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he and our fathers died. From there they were removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. In verse 9, we come to another theme in Stephen's defense. The patriarchs, our forefathers, had a way of being terrible people in the process of missing the whole point of God's plan. And so the forerunners of the Sanhedrin are the ones who got jealous and sold Joseph into slavery in Egypt. But notice God was not with the forefathers primarily. He was with Joseph in particular, and, jo and God rescued him from the plans of the other forefathers. And when the forefathers got hungry in the famine, God ultimately worked through Joseph, the one they rejected, to save them. So I would just kind of ask here, do we see Jesus in this? The forefathers rejected and abused Joseph, but God uses Joseph to save them. An obvious parallel to what Jesus does. He's rejected by uh, the leading people among God's people, but he's the one who's actually the Savior. And that's pretty much what we can say of Joseph as well, in a sense. I would also point out that Joseph doesn't reveal himself to his brothers until the second visit. I don't know, it's kind of strange that he points that out here. As I see it, Stephen is perhaps emphasizing that the patriarchs could be a little bit dense at times. Sometimes it took a while for them to understand they, these things. Uh, but the main point of the passage, though, is that God uses the man they rejected to save them, an obvious reference to Jesus. So I think that's what we need to get out of this paragraph. All right, let's continue on with Acts 7, verses 17 through 29. Acts 7, 17 through 29. But as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our father so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. It was at this time that Moses was born, and he was lovely in the sight of God, and he was nurtured three months in his father's home. And after he had been set outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of forty, it entered his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? You do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? At this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Up in verse 17, notice how God is blessing the people in Egypt. In other words, I think it's just another reminder here, you do not need to live in Jerusalem and worship in the temple in order to be blessed by God. God is everywhere. And I think that goes back to one of these suggestions by one of our members that God is everywhere would, would be a very good summary of chapter 7. Uh, starting in verse 20, Stephen tells the story of Moses. And notice how respectful he is in explaining Moses. Remember, one of the charges against Stephen is that he has blasphemed Moses. And we don't see this in Stephen's defense. He's not blaspheming Moses. Uh, Stephen doesn't have a problem with Moses. However, who does have a problem with Moses in this story? In verse 24, Moses takes vengeance when he sees an Egyptian treating one of his brethren unfairly. And in verse 25, Moses 
supposed that his brethren would understand that God was using him to deliver them from Egypt. However, they do not understand. So I hope we notice what's going on here. Just as the forefathers rejected Joseph, who ended up being used by God to save them, so also they have now rejected Moses, who is also being used by God to save them. So we have Joseph, and now we have Moses. And not only did they not understand that God was using Moses to deliver them, but notice the attitude in verses 26 through 28. The next day, Moses tries to break up a fight between two Israelites. So it's unrelated to what happened previously. He tries to make peace between these two Israelites fighting with each other. But the man who is attacking his fellow Israelite really cuts on Moses, and he asks, Who made you ruler and judge over us? In other words, he completely is rejecting the leadership of Moses. Well, Moses gets pretty nervous about that, and he makes a run for it out to the land of Midian. So again, not only do the Israelites reject uh, Moses, a major theme of this chapter, but now we also see how Moses is treating, or how Stephen is treating Moses with the utmost of respect. So it's not Stephen who's rejecting Moses here, it is the Jewish people, the forerunners of the Sanhedrin. They rejected Moses. Or as Stephen might be able to say here, you are the ones who would have been rejecting Moses if he were here with us today. Not me, but you. And really, this is what Jesus was talking about over in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 10, 11, and 12, when he said, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you and people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Right there, Jesus was saying that when we are rejected, when we are harassed for preaching the gospel, don't be shocked by that. That's just the way it goes. People are treating us just like they've treated all of the other prophets. And that's where Stephen, that's where he's heading with this. That's what he's saying here. I mean, we would like to think that we're the ones being persecuted. But really, we need to make sure that we're not the ones doing the persecuting. So Stephen is turning this back on them. But that's the accusation Stephen is in the process of making that the men on the Sanhedrin aren't Joseph, they aren't Moses, but they are Joseph's brothers, and they are the Israelites who rejected Moses. That's his accusation. They're accusing him of rejecting Moses and blaspheming Moses, but Stephen is turning this around on it. Well, let's continue tonight with Acts 7, verses 30 through 34. Acts 7, 30 through 34. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their groans, and I have come down to rescue them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. Once again, where is Moses when God speaks to him? Definitely not in the temple, is he? There's no temple at this point. He's out in the wilderness of Sinai. He is in the middle of nowhere. And again, down in verse 33, notice the emphasis on holy ground. Holy ground is not in Jerusalem, but it's out there in the wilderness. Holy ground is wherever God is. And remember, Stephen is also on trial here for speaking against the temple. But I think he's pointing out here, it's God who actually has a long history of speaking to people outside the temple. And in verse 34, Stephen once again uh, honors Moses by emphasizing that God chooses Moses to send to Egypt. Stephen doesn't have a problem with Moses at all. It's the Jewish people who really do. Well, let's continue then with Acts 7, 35 through 43. Acts 7, 35 through 43. This Moses whom they disowned, saying, who has made you a ruler and a judge, is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. 
This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers. And he received living oracles to pass on to you. Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him, and in their hearts turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. At that time they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol, and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, it was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices forty years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took among the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the god Ramtha, the images which you made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. So in verse 35, Stephen emphasizes um, what he just briefly mentioned in the previous paragraph, that Moses was approved by God as a ruler and a judge but he was rejected by the Jewish people as being a ruler and deliverer. They didn't want to have anything of it. So with God's approval, Moses was a leader, and he performed miraculous signs to prove that he was, in fact, God's spokesperson. Now, note the similarities to Jesus here are amazing, aren't they? Jesus also performed miracles, a lot like Moses did. And everybody knows this. So instead of blaspheming Moses, as he has been accused of doing, uh, Stephen is actually honoring Moses, and it's the Jewish authorities who are really following in the same pattern of harassing Joseph and Moses and now Jesus. This is the pattern that they've established, and that's what Stephen is pointing out here. In verse 37, Stephen quotes from Deuteronomy 18, 15, where Moses uh, passes along <clears throat> a message from God and says to the sons of Israel that God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. That is a, a well-known passage. The Jews were looking for this prophet like Moses, supposedly. Uh, this is the same passage that Peter had just quoted to the council back in Acts 3.22. And so the men in the council can probably very clearly see where this is going. Stephen's message is starting to sound a lot like Peter's message. But Stephen takes it even further. Even though Moses received living oracles from God, Stephen says that our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but they repudiated him, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt. That's interesting. They didn't just go back to Egypt, but their hearts had already gone back. They were already in Egypt in their hearts, even though they were still standing there at the base of Mount Sinai. But it's a devastating accusation, but it cannot be denied. They all know this. This is straight from the first five books of the Old Testament, that were written by Moses. And so if somebody were to try to deny this, they would be the ones who would be denying Moses, but it cannot be denied. This comes straight from Moses. So Stephen is using the words of Moses to combat this accusation that he personally has blasphemed Moses. And not only did the fathers reject Moses, but they also rejected God by telling Aaron to make them gods to lead them back to Egypt. That's a reference to the golden calf, and who knows what else happened there. Uh, Stephen is saying that our fathers worshipped idols. Not only did they worship idols, but notice he points out that they were happy about it. They loved it. They reveled in this. They were rejoicing in the works of their hands. Look at how awesome we are for making these gods to lead us back to Egypt. But in response, God punishes them eventually, as the worship of idols gets worse and worse by sending them off to Babylon into captivity. So a lot of history is covered here. Hundreds of years are summarized in just a few verses. And again, all of this is common knowledge. Everybody knows this, especially the people in the room. These are highly educated men Stephen is talking to here. And they can't deny any of this. The Jewish people did, in fact, reject God by rejecting his servant Moses, just as they are still doing by rejecting Jesus. Well, let's wrap it up tonight with one last paragraph. This is Acts 7, verses 44 through 50. Acts 7, 44 through 50. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. And having received it in their turn, our fathers brought 
it in with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? Again, remember, one of the two main charges against Stephen is that he had spoken against the temple. But notice here, Stephen points out that at one time the temple itself was portable, wasn't it? It wasn't the temple at the beginning. In other words, there was a time before the temple when the Israelites were pleasing to God in some way. And they were able to do that somehow without the temple. Um, back in the time of Moses, there was no temple. At God's instruction, God made not a temple, not a building, but he made a tent, didn't he? A tent is not a sturdy structure. It's, it's portable. It's something you fold up and bring with you. God gave him the pattern for this tent. Moses constructed it as he was instructed, and they then brought it with them into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. So again, a long period of time is, is summarized here. And Stephen then goes on to explain that the temple, the building, wasn't even God's idea in the first place, was it? The temple didn't start in the mind of God, we might say, that the temple started with David asking to build it. Remember, David built himself a palace and then kind of felt guilty that God didn't have a palace as nice as he had. So God didn't ask this from David, but David asked to be able to do this. Uh, and he asked this of God. It was David's idea, not God's idea. And David uh, asked God. God then gave him permission. And on top of this, it isn't even David who builds the temple, is it? It's Solomon. And even then, we have the reminder that God does not dwell in houses made by human hands. And as we think about this, let's remember that Saul, the future apostle, is most likely hearing this. We'll get to Saul a little bit later in next week's class. And Saul, or Paul, as his name was changed to, he will go on to make a similar argument um, as he's preaching on the Areopagus in Athens in Acts chapter 17. Remember that God does not dwell in temples made with hands? But it's just interesting to me that Saul was apparently listening pretty carefully here to Stephen and what he's saying. And it's also interesting to wonder whether Paul remembers Stephen a number of years later as he is preaching in Athens. In my mind, at least as a preacher, you know how you think at like 700 words a minute, but you can only speak at about 150 words a minute? Well, that's true of you in the audience, okay? I know as I speak, you can run circles around me in your mind. That's why we can listen to somebody talking and make a grocery list and plan our day tomorrow like kind of simultaneously because our minds have that ability. Well, I'm just saying that as a speaker, we also have that ability. We can speak and also be thinking additional thoughts. And so I'm just wondering, as Paul is preaching on the Areopagus, talking about temples, you know, God does not dwell in temples made by human hands. I'm wondering as he speaks those words, if he's not remembering Stephen as he's speaking and, of course, his own role in, in Stephen's death. So I'm just saying Stephen is perhaps something of a great hero to the Apostle Paul as well. And I know it seems rather abrupt to stop here. There, there's no, you know, dramatic conclusion right at this point, but uh, I do want to respect your time tonight and not go too long. And so let's pause here and let's come back next Wednesday with the application section of Stephen's sermon. So next week he answers the so what question in a very powerful way. So next week, let's pick up then with Acts 751 as Stephen concludes his defense, which is really not his defense, is it? But it's a defense of the Christian faith. He doesn't answer the charges in a way that he can get out of them. He's not defending himself. The goal here is not an acquittal for Stephen. The goal here is to defend Jesus and to explain Jesus to this group. So between now and next Wednesday, let's do the best we can to read the rest of Acts 7. And probably the first paragraph of chapter 8 really goes with the last paragraph of chapter 7. So we'll probably cover the last few verses of chapter 7 and move into the first three or four verses of chapter 8 at least next week. So be reading chapter 7 and 8 
And let's also be <clears throat> thinking of other ways that we might be able to summarize chapter 7 using a word that starts with a letter G. Uh, today I was just thinking that God in history may be another possibility because that's what we've seen. God in history. God in the history of the Jewish people. But if you think of something better... Uh, please let me know. Uh, just a quick update on last week as we closed. Two of you got in touch, uh, offering to help with the cleaning of the building, and that is great. Um, some of you might have been interested, but might have just forgotten to get with me on Sunday. So if you can help, uh, please let me know. We're still looking for someone to help with June, July, August. Uh, but it doesn't even take an extra trip to church. Some have even stayed after worship a few minutes on Sunday or come early on Sunday morning before worship to vacuum take out the trash or you know hit the restrooms or whatever but uh, we appreciate having a, a place of our own to come together to worship but as i said last week with blessing often comes responsibility and this is one of those times and uh, thank you for considering it. if you want to sign up for a month of building cleaning let me know uh, thank you for taking the time to study together tonight i hope to see you for worship on sunday either at 9 or 10 30 this would be a great time to sign up let me know if i can help and let me know if there's something that we need to be praying about but let's close by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for giving us your book, and thank you for Luke and his account of the growth of the early church. Tonight, we're especially thankful for Stephen and for his courage in speaking the truth in a convincing way. When we personally are confronted with truth from your word, we pray that we would, in all humility, receive that word implanted in our hearts and change our hearts, change our minds, and turn from sin. Instead of getting angry and hardening our hearts, we pray that we would always turn back to you. We pray that we would be people who listen and obey. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.